Good day chaps. So today's video will continue where we left off. In previous videos we've covered a bit about why the Future Main Battle Tank Group was formed, their goals and aims, and touched over some of the early study work into vehicles which began before the program started, such as MBT-80 and KPZ-3. We also looked at the early problems between the UK and Germany on the discussions around weight class, with the Germans favouring the MLC-50 and the UK the MLC-60 class, and how that the British originally wanted a turreted vehicle. This was reflected in both nations having different GSTs, or General Staff Targets. These are the guiding requirements what a new product should have in a broad spectrum, followed up by a General Staff Operational Requirement, or GSOR, which will then refine and narrow down the GSTs to the individual aspects. These can be roughly equated to 1. We want a new thing to replace a current thing and 2. Here is a list of what that new thing must have or improve upon the old thing. Now this is a crude but simple breakdown as the actual process can be far more complex. Is it urgent, thus a UOR, or is it for a set date? Is it sequential or is it a radically new idea? Not to mention budget issues and political industrial issues and even the order they are presented can be switched around if a preceding target or requirement was there beforehand. So with Future Main Battle Tank, as said, both parties entered with different staff targets for what was required, although there were several similarities. And it has been said after the fact that further examination of both nations' targets ahead of time could resolve many issues. If this project was to work, compromises would need to be met. The UK's initial desire to have a turreted tank of Class 60 was not going to sit with the German ideology, who primarily favoured a casemated concept, and they were in a position to begin work on test beds of such ideas well ahead of the UK, due to how each nation's R&D teams worked, with the Germans typically involving their industrial heads in such projects from an early stage, such as Krauss Maffei, Rheinmetall and Mack while the UK did not, and preferred component testing and theory first, with mock-ups made on site and industrial aspects being drawn in much later. In order to overcome this conflict, it was therefore agreed to split the work into two areas. The UK and Germany would now work on a casemated concept as the primary solution to future main battle tank, while the turreted concepts would be placed into a reserve study to be worked on in a secondary role and that any advantages over the casemated vehicles or disadvantages could be used in comparison studies. Again, over the following years, this will shift back and forth and, quite frankly, becomes a bit of a bloody headache. But bear with me. While this was going on, both sides also agreed to continue working on their own national concepts. For the UK, this would be a more heavily armed Class 60 tank, which would merge into the projects A1 and A2. While the Germans said they'd be looking at some of the top-mounted external guns as their national project, but were in fact working on Leopard 2, which they conveniently forgot to mention at the time. These national projects, although outside of the remit of future main battle tank, would also bleed over in several cases. Each team then went back and began to work on their designs and concepts, and agreed to present their ideas for refinement and validation in 1975. However, further work would be done in between. During 73 and 74, several tests had also been carried out as well, to validate data, notably armour trials and live firings, which was to ensure that the numbers presented by each team could be met. This involved the German team coming to the UK and observing the work done on rangers, firing at trob and blocks and steel plates, corresponding to the thickness of armour that both teams were working around to see if they were indeed viable. It also involved the UK testing the idea of casemated tanks out with the Swedish S-Tank in Germany, with some rather underhand diplomacy which the Swedish were not quite aware of. Fast forward to mid-April 1975 and the national selection of concepts for the initial data exchange programme. This put forward to the designs most favoured from each of the lists presented and each team was then to go over the good points and bad points of each vehicle and why it was selected. 
Much like the previous meeting, the primary focus was still on the semi-fixed gun tanks in both nations. These were a British tank with a single semi-fixed gun to the front, while the Germans offered three vehicles. One was a twin semi-fixed gun, and another with twin external guns, both by Mack, and the concept with the driver and the turret by Krauss Meffei. For reserve concepts that were still to be investigated further, the British presented two tanks, both of a conventional nature with a driver in the hull, unlimited traverse, and either a V-12 or V-16 engine, while the German reserve project was the driver in the turret tank with only 90 degrees of traverse left or right. The British team then went over to Kiel at the end of June and later Munich in June 1975 to validate the German vehicles. During this trip, both the twin gun vehicles were initially validated and agreed to progress further. However, the original six-wheeled Krauss Maffei driver in turret vehicle was found to be problematic and dropped, while a seven-wheel proposal was accepted, although moved into the reserve studies as concept B. The Germans, meanwhile, had visited the UK in late July 1975 to assess the UK vehicles and evaluate their work. However, this would not be translated and none of their main findings were passed up the chain, as the overall steering group backtracked in November 1975 and instead immediately pulled the casemated concepts from the British main project and instead replaced them back with a turreted reserve concept, A1 and A2. We'll cover why this sudden change was made, as well as the fundamental differences between what the UK wanted and the Germans wanted in their validations, as well as look at the pros and cons of such designs in another video. But first, let's take a few of the British casemated vehicles up to this point. So the first is the MLC-50 and 60 semi-fixed gun main battle tank. And yes, I said main battle tank. You see, it's not just the Swedes who called casemated vehicles a tank. The UK and Germany both refer to these styles as tanks as well. These vehicles are in the 50 and 60 class range. The first, the MLC-50 at 47.8 tonnes, the second at 55 tonnes, with the heavier vehicle having one extra road wheel. The hulls are aluminium on all sides, between 30 to 40 millimetres, and the front, which is steel, at 50 millimetres thick, and then Chobamama blocks added over the top of that. The lighter vehicle is immune to 105 millimetre guns and similar heat weapons to the front while the heavier vehicle is immune to 125mm guns over the front and heat weapons as well as the 84mm heat attacks to the side. Both vehicles could fully operate without the chop and packs if needed but were therefore only proof to 90mm guns over the front and 20mm guns on the side if this was the case. Where these vehicles become a bit more interesting is in the crew choices. These were clearly inspired from the Swedish vehicles during the UK's first examination in the 60s. Both had a three-man crew, with a commander, a gunner-driver combination, and a loader-rear-driver combination facing backwards. This meant the commander would select the target, the driver would move into position, and then engage the target, being able to steer the tank while aiming, but not fire on the move. If the gunner was knocked out, the loader could reverse and escape. Power was provided by a CV-10 at 938 brake horsepower through a 5-speed gearbox to 6 road wheels with hydrogas suspension. Although like many of these drawings, no speed is listed. The weapon for both vehicles is recorded as a 110mm gun with 40 rounds stored and plus 20 and minus 10 degrees gun depression. When evaluated, the pros were that the vehicles had good vision low profile, good protection, and less restriction on engine choices. However, the cons were an overtaxed crew, no fire on the move, and it had to use its tracks to aim, and that the opening on the front is also of a concern. The next vehicle is actually quite inventive. It's the MLC-50 semi-fixed gun with pod main battle tank, and aimed to save weight and volume by removing the way the gun was mounted. Instead of a conventional trunnion system, recuperators and a gimbal like the others, 
The whole inner hull was a pod that could tilt up or down, with the gun fixed to this pod in elevation and depression. This pod was fully stabilised and would have kept level as the vehicle moved over rough terrain. This means that a lot of the usual internal fixtures were removed, and so the armour could be thick on the front without adding too much extra weight, coming in at 47 tonnes. It was also noted that if needed, such a design would be ideal for an autoloader, reducing the crew to two men, although it appears this idea was quickly dropped. The vehicle thus has three men, a commander, driver gunner and loader rear driver, for the same reasons the previous vehicle. Otherwise, apart from the hull gun combo, the vehicle was similar. It had a CV10 engine at 938 brake horsepower, six road wheels and hydrogas suspension. The pros and cons of the vehicle were considered as a low profile, good armour, crew stability on hard terrain, no gun slot weakness, but downsides were no firing on the move, traversing on tracks only, and a risk of the pod jamming. Well guys, that's it for today's part. More tanks to come as we meander down this journey. I hope you like these vehicles and some of the stuff we're discussing. As always, any questions, ask below. And until next time, toodle pip.